Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, I'm with a guest, and his name is Ted Rice. He's the host of the Legendary Life podcast, where they have over 500 episodes about body transformation, fat loss, and doing it all remotely as well, because Ted Rice has been working remotely. And where where are you at, Ted, right now, currently? I'm in Brazil, Brasilia, Brazil, which is uh, the capital of Brazil. That's awesome. And uh, you've been down there for a while now, right? Yeah, I lived in Brazil eight months last year, half of the time in Brasilia, half the time in Florianopolis, uh, which is an amazing place down there uh, in the south. Not that well known by Americans, but a lot of Europeans travel there for vacation. And then Mm -hmm. now this time I've been here three months. So I spent almost a year in Brazil, 11 months in Brazil by the time I leave at the end of August. And how do you manage to do that? What do you mean? Um, I mean, I guess both in terms of work and then in terms of visa. Ah, yeah. I mean, well, as an American, I get 90 days in Brazil without doing an extension. So I get 90 days here, I think six months in Mexico. Uh, I think it's 90 days in Colombia as well. And so, man, you know, I don't typically like, I I don't have any long-term visas. I just been hopping around. And this journey started for me in 2018 with, I know this is my Latin life podcast, but uh, uh, I was in Southeast Asia Thailand, Bali, Malaysia, Vietnam. And, um, yeah, so, so I've just been hopping around and I've been doing it ever since February of 2018. And it's getting a little bit, I'm wanting to set up shop somewhere and settle down a bit, but it's been just, well, an amazing time. And and truly like, you know how it is Vance, when, when you get experienced to all these different cultures, it changes your life. That's awesome. And I think I first found out about you on Twitter and I saw photos of you like working out in what definitely looked like Medellin or Bogota in the background. And mm-hmm. I noticed that you weren't really like your your online persona wasn't really necessarily about the travel or about Latin America. It took actually a little bit of digging to even find out that you weren't like in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, people who listen to my podcast, have shared my travels, you know, <laughs> I would start the podcast when I was in Thailand, I was like, Sawadee Kaab, you know, I'd start the podcast and try to bring a little bit of the culture that I was living in to the people who are listening to my show. Um, but, but yeah, I'm really focused on, I'm really focused on helping. I, I work mostly with entrepreneurs, executives, founders, other high performance professionals, and I help them get fit. And while I don't even think I have one other nomadic client, it would be fun to have a nomadic client actually. But um, yeah, because we could maybe actually hang out in person. Um, And and I do in-person events. Um, I've got one in Mexico coming up where I'm going to be meeting with a, a client for three days, but he's, you know, he's a sit, he's, he's, uh, you know, running his company. It's got to be there most of most weeks of the right. year. Yeah. I guess more of the travel stuff comes out on your podcast, huh? Yeah. And I let, it's something that I want to talk more about because as you know, Vance, like it changes how you see things. It changes how you see health. It changes like um, most Americans, for example, they think that, you know, oh, well, I'm obese, but not as obese as that person. And then you go to Thailand and statistically speaking, they have a obesity crisis there, but everybody looks skinny. And the same thing in Brazil, where I am right now, um, what I love about Brazil in particular in Brasilia in, in the location where I'm at is in D, uh, DF, uh, the federal district is there's parks on Sundays. They close down the major street. I don't know what the name of it is forgot, but, um, they close down the street. And so you start to see like, oh man, People are people you love to eat in Brazil, right? Steak, uh, the churrascarias, uh, the picanha, caipirinhas, 
uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But like they also have a very active lifestyle. And then you start to, even in Miami, um, Miami are, people are pretty fit as well, but like people take health more seriously here. I feel like people in Miami, it's like, eh, I got to hit the club. I got to hit the workout first because if not, I'm not going to be able to drink champagne and snort, you know, Coke all night. Right. So it's not really that health oriented, I feel. Um, so by traveling, I, I want to incorporate more of the lessons I've learned in traveling. That's just, you know, um, I'm working on that. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I actually would love to hear the whole story, uh, including the Asia stuff. So basically how you left Miami and kind of what your trajectory has been like since then uh, across across all the continents. Yeah, cool. So um, a lot of people know me back in Miami because I was a personal trainer for over 20 years there. I started in 1999. I worked with celebrities like Robert Downey Jr., uh, Ricky Martin, worked with R Richard B Branson for one day, one morning, uh, but worked with his wife quite a bit. So I had a good thing going there. And I had a lot of club owner clients, restaurant owner clients, a lot of entrepreneurs of different types of businesses. It, it was good in a way, but I just felt like I, I got to a point where, especially with personal training, it's a bit of handholding. Um, and I really wanted to do more and I wanted to help people more. And I wanted to, I wanted to help people really transform their bodies. And I felt like I was in a rut. And at the same time, I felt like I had outgrown Miami and I'm very, I like my city, but, um, I had been there for a long time and I, I, it's got a certain vibe down there if you've ever been. And one of the things I like about it, it does have like, you know, my Latin life podcast could totally <laughs> include Miami, you know, with For the sure. vibe there, but, uh, but I needed to get out. I needed a change of environment and yeah, I just, I was married at the time and my wife, who's actually my, my, uh, business partner still, we ended the personal relationship, but we still have a professional relationship and we, she just looked at me. It's like, we have a little bit of money in the bank and we could pay off some of our debts and just keep doing what we're doing, or we could leave. And we had met people who had done that, who, who became digital nomads. And in this case, they, they went to Thailand and mm -hmm. we, it, it took me about like maybe 10 seconds. I was thinking, I was like, okay, I'm in, I want to get out of here. <laughs> And, and uh, at this point where you're booking the flight to Asia, um, how many of the podcast episodes had you recorded of the 500 plus and how much of your client base or how much money were you making online? Yeah, we uh, making money online was really sporadic for us. I don't remember how much, but it wasn't that consistent. So we weren't leaving like, oh man, we've, we're making enough money. We, um, you know, this is just going to, we're going to keep growing. We, we, we had run some coaching programs and we made a few thousand dollars here and there. And we did, tried some other things, affiliates, but we didn't have anything systematized. And as far as how many podcast episodes, um, we, I had been doing it. So I've been doing this for about seven years. So if we subtract four years from that, I've been doing it about, you know, in between three or four years. So there were, you know, half of our episodes are, are, were up already. And, cool. um, yeah, we, we still win anyway. That's awesome. Well, you had already basically taken steps in an entrepreneurial direction and you must've known that you wanted to build out the online segment more. For sure. Vance. I mean, the situation to, to go into a little bit more detail, we had started the podcast. We knew it was the way forward, although we didn't see exactly what that was going to look like at the end, but we knew like, okay, these are the steps we need to keep taking and the steps that we need to stop taking. Um, you know, my, uh, Giselle, my business partner, she had stopped working. She was, she's a marketing professional. She had stopped working for, um, you know, she was doing marketing consulting for businesses there. Uh, she's Brazilian. So she 
was working with these businesses who had Brazilian clients and helping with their marketing. I was training, you know, I already told you who I was training and, um, yeah, so we knew we wanted to do something online and we just knew we, we had built some things out, but it was so hard to kind of have the headspace to create something when we kept having like to go to work and do stuff, or at least I had to go to work. She was working for the podcast full time by at that point. And so we knew we wanted to do something online. We weren't sure what it was going to look like, but we had some few ideas. And when I got to Asia, man, I mean, like we had some ideas. I have a little bit of a name um, internationally not much of one, but a little bit of one enough to kind of try to put together some, uh, some seminars for personal trainers to teach them how to get better results with their clients. Mm -hmm. And we had that scheduled for the Philippines. We'd had it scheduled for Australia. Um, and everything just fell apart. We tried to do Hong Kong, Malaysia, it all fell apart. And then we came back to the coaching idea and just like we needed to do something there, there's some other, there's some other, I'm shortening this a lot, but at the end of the, the, the road, the journey to figuring out how, what to move forward with, we had done coaching already. And it was like, okay, we need to figure out, like, we need to go back to what was successful. And we ended up finding someone, oh gosh, what's his name? Russ Rufino. And he has like a high ticket coaching model. And we learned from him. And, um, the rest is history, man. That started like, I started going full into my online coaching, started getting clients, great results. And I'm making a lot more money than I did when I was training all those famous people back in, back in Miami beach. And I love my life now I'm get to travel around and, um, just, uh, it wouldn't have been possible had I not taken that, that first leap. Yeah. So you trained Iron Man and Richard Branson. Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably one of the few people who are not, you know, like, like super high level entrepreneurs that Richard Branson would pay to talk to. Um, one of the few entre mini entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs, baby entrepreneurs, baby business owners that Richard Branson has actually paid money for me <laughs> to spend time with me. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit about how, you know, you, you crushed Asia and then eventually made your way to Latin America. Yeah. Uh, Thailand was just, Giselle's from Brazil. So she wouldn't, she didn't want to come back. In fact, while we were together, I had never even been to Brazil. She never didn't want to go. She really wanted to get away from Brazil. And, um, I love Brazil but I could see why people from here feel that way. And mm -hmm. so that's in part why we decided to go to Asia. And when we got there, it was such a culture shock. It's not like, whoa, everybody's speaking Spanish in Colombia. What a culture shock. It's like, man, I don't understand anything. Like Thai language is so difficult and it's so wildly just uh, the culture is so beautifully and strangely different. It's Buddhist culture. And it just, when I first got there, I was a fish out of water. I was like, I'm a tall white dude. I feel like people are looking at me and I'm, I just moved here. Bangkok, if you've ever been there, um, it's not a particularly beautiful city. It's, it's really urban and industrial, but, um, but it was such an incredible time. We were treated with such kindness. We stayed in a very like local area of Thailand. Um, I forget the station that we stayed off of, of the BTS in case there's any Thailand lovers there, but I started training Muay Thai there. Oh my God. The food is so incredible. If you love Thai food, you must get yourself to Thailand. It is going to Thailand Makes is sense. a life changing Makes experience sense. for anyone. <laughs> What's that? Makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> But uh, it was incredible. And, you know, we ended up in Bali and all these other places. And yeah, and um, that became normal life. And then eventually we moved back to, we, Giselle and I split up personally. 
And uh, I came back to this side of the world to be closer to my family in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil. That's awesome. I'm guessing it was the type of thing where you went back to the States at the start of 2020 and then eventually kind of maybe made your way to Mexico or something. Um, the, what had happened is I left Thailand in early 2020. I came to see my dad in Vero beach, Florida. And, um, you know, every time I come back, I don't know if you feel this way too, Vance, but I, every, I spent a, even a month in Miami recently, every time I go back to the States, I'm like, Ooh, this is cool. But I think, uh, I think elsewhere is cooler. Now, I love the United States. I love being American. I'm very proud to be an American and traveling has even made me more, is really, that's where the pride has come from to see how special the United States is. But, um, you know, I think it's a very unhealthy place and it's not, not even, I'm not going to even say, I think it is 70% of the people are struggling with their weight. Um, you know, that's just a, a symptom of the psychological uh, stress that people are under in the United States, the culture. And, um, yeah, I just, uh, I ended up going to Columbia right before the pandemic started. I was, I was there for, actually I arrived there on my birthday, February 2nd, I arrived in Medellin and, um, it was in March 15th or 16th that the whole pandemic started and I spent mm -hmm. a whole lockdown there in Columbia. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you touched on a lot of things that I wanted to ask about, but I almost don't want to disrupt the flow. So what was it like? Uh, I guess, was this your first time in Colombia? When I, on February 2nd? Yeah. Now I had been to Costa Rica before. I've been to Mexico before, but this was my first time to Colombia. And, um, and it was kind of cool. I was going to go to Lima or I was going to go to Buenos Aires and, uh, I, I was like, man, you know, which one should I go to? I actually posted on Facebook and asked people. And someone who I didn't know at the time, but we were Facebook friends and would later become a friend of mine, James, um, he, he said, oh, you got to go to Medellin. And I wasn't quite sure what he was hinting at, but, you know, it, it was like, no, you got to go to Medellin. And, and so he kind of hinted, I was single at the time. And he was like, oh, you got to You got to go there. And I was like, okay, all right, I'm going to go. It's closer okay. than Argentina. And while the food in Lima, uh, Peru sounds amazing. And I want to do the Machu Picchu thing. I, I really, you know, I'm okay. I'm sold. And he was going to be there as well. So we ended up meeting up and that's one of the beautiful things about like what we do, I think, is we get to connect with, we get to connect with people on social media and then you can actually meet them in person and, um, you know, build out your social circle that way. So yeah, that was the first time in Colombia and uh, had a great time there until, you know, the the great pandemic of 2020 started. But you stuck it through. Yeah, and it was a strict lockdown too, but uh, I'd, I'd rather be where I was in Colombia with that strict lockdown in my nice apartment with the beautiful view of Medellin and a huge balcony. Uh, where I could get outside. That's where you saw that photo taken was on that balcony. Huge yeah, balcony. Yeah, the one you, uh, what's it called? Po um, stapled. What's the word? Stapled to your Twitter. Exactly. Yeah, pinned to uh, my pinned. Twitter profile. Yeah. So maybe this would be a, a good time to ask a little bit about home workouts and uh, workouts for a digital nomad because typically a nomad is not going to have access to a gym that might be going from city to city. I'm an absolute expert at finding outdoor calisthenic gyms and working out at the, at the outdoor gym. So that's what I do. Uh, cool. what, what do you do? Yeah, it really depends. But these days, cause I I've done a lot of things over the years. I, I've been in this business 23 years. I've been working out since I was 12, but, um, now what I do, like what I've been doing recently is kind of what I've been doing when I was in Columbia locked in that room. Cause I'm, I'm really focused on growing my business right now and growing specifically my reach. And, um, and I've been, I've used bands and while <laughs> it's a good, good segue because while I was in Columbia locked in a room, I got better results than people with a full gym. And people were asking me like, how are you getting, like, are you taking the steroids? I'm like, 
I'm like, man, I'm locked in a room in Colombia. I can't even leave like you uh, people in America. It's like, we suggest that you stay at home. It's like, no, if I leave, I'm going to get a $300 fine and hassled by the police. So I just, you know, stayed put. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I just used bands. And more specifically, I know principles that lead to getting great results and a few tricks as well. So I used a band routine, a band and body weight routine, and I applied the principles that we know work. So take a use good form on exercise. So if you're adding weight and your, your squats all of a sudden go, you're you're only going halfway down or you're bench pressing, you're going halfway down. You might be working your ego, but you're not going to be getting the best gains when you do that. And I unfortunately made that mistake a lot. Um, when I was younger, I'm 45 now. So in my twenties, so, so use good form. The second thing would be to slow down your movements. Um, a big problem that I see with people, especially athletes. And, and again, I'm, I'm guilty of this too. Um, cause I'm more of an athlete. I'm not like a bodybuilder guy, right? I love Brazilian mm-hmm. jujitsu, Muay Thai, um, scuba diving, that type of thing. Right. And, um, so slowing down your reps, because if you're more athletic, you want to get through things fast. Or if you're just a, you know, a person who's like, man, I don't have time to be working out, but I'll do it. Uh, Let me rush through it. But slowing down your reps. And what we know is if you take about three seconds on the way down and three seconds on the way up, you're going to get way better results. than if you just rush through the reps and hit your, you know, eight or 12 or 20 or whatever it is and say, okay, I did my reps. No, go slow. Don't worry about the weight. Don't worry about how many you do. The the form and the speed of the rep execution, that matters most. And that's what I did in that room. And the next thing after that would be to apply what I call the one more rep rule. So always doing one more rep than what you did last time, right? Always doing one more rep than what you did last time. And so if you did, uh, like, for example, I was doing band resisted push-ups in the room because um there's a lot of there there's some some studies showing like band resisted push-ups are as effective as bench press at stimulating your chest. So um so for example let's say I got 15 reps with like a medium band. So I'll go for 16 reps with the same band. And the workout after that 17 reps. And if you do that and consistently do that over time, it's going to lead to big changes. Now, after adding reps, add weight. So eventually you'll have to go from that medium band to use the same example. You have to go to like the medium heavy band. Um, And then again, you start the process, figure out how many reps you can get with that medium heavy band. And then again, start to add more reps over time. Um, And then the the final thing would be to eventually add sets, but adding sets is the thing that you do last or Mm -hmm. the thing that I do recommend people do last. And the reason is it takes more time to do it and it's harder on your body to do it. And you really got to cycle through the volume. You can't just stay at five or six sets per exercise. Every time you train, it's going to get pretty hard to maintain that. And the workouts are going to get long, but you can start to do that. If you're at a, position right now where it's like, man, Ted, I'm, I hear you. I'm already using good technique. I've been doing this for a while. Um, my reps are, you know, slow enough to stimulate the muscle. And, um, you know, I've been adding reps, but kind of hit a wall. Can't add weight without, you know, something happening. Let's just say, then that's when you start adding sets. So that's what I did in that room, man. And my body <laughs> got all, I, I got called the white Bruce Lee. So, which I took <laughs> as a big compliment. And so what percentage of your home workouts are you using resistance bands? Yeah, almost the entire, well, almost the entire uh, workout for the upper body. For the lower body, I'm just using body weight exercises like Bulgarian split squats, squats, that type of thing. Okay. Yeah. I've tried cause it's so easy to travel with uh resistance bands, uh, that I guess that would be part of like any, uh, fitness enthusiast, nomad 
travel kit. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm try. I, I'm like you, man. I like uh, calisthenics. It's just I find weights boring, you know. Uh, which is okay, by the way. If you love weights and doing powerlifting, cool. Um, and you know, Vance, you like doing calisthenics. I like that too. That's why I prefer. So I travel with gymnastics rings too. But um, right now, I don't want to say I'm too lazy to go to the gym, which is like a five minute walk. I'm staying in, like you know, the the most well known hotel here in Brasilia and the gym's like a five minute walk. Um, and, but it's like, I can stay here and crush my work and listen to things while I'm working out. So that's what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. So I have kind of like a home, uh, what's it called? Body weight routine, but I don't use resistance bands. I don't know. I just, maybe I, I just never had anyone teach me. And so I've tried and just never got hyped up about it. How do you, how do you get someone hyped up about resistance bands? You know what? That's such a great point. So number one, people hate training with resistance bands and for good reason. Resistance bands, number one, they're really funky to use because the more you, the, the more you stretch a rubber band, everyone knows this, you more, you stretch a rubber band, the more resistance you get. And that can be good for exercises like push-ups or overhead presses or even squats or deadlifts, if that's what you're into, that's even a powerlifting technique is adding bands. It's called accommodating resistance. So you actually get stronger, faster, you get better results by using bands on pushing exercises. Like I mentioned, any pushing exercise, um, that you can attach the bands to overhead press, bench press, um, you know, deadlift squats too. Uh, but when you do pulling exercises, that then they suck. They're too easy at the beginning and they're too hard at the end, especially with the thicker bands. So here's what you got to do. Number one, you have to understand, like you, you have to be taught how to use them or they're going to suck. And also you have to use the right bands. I use body elastics bands. And what's really important is you don't get the thick ass resistance bands. You have to use multiple smaller ones that add up to a higher weight. Otherwise, it's going to be like super easy when you start and then feel like impossible to move uh, because the resistance goes up exponentially when you pull a rubber band. So you have to get multiple bands on it. So it's a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a learning curve to do it properly. But I teach my clients, every client who joins my coaching program, we send them this, the body elastics band set. And, you know, we teach them how to do it. Uh, I have videos on how to do it properly. And so you can get great results with resistance bands, but I'm not super excited about using them. I just think they're, I like calisthenics way more pull-ups, ring rows, ring dips, you know, um, outside of like using the accommodating resistance exercises, like doing a push up with a, a, a rubber band. Um, you know, I don't really love using bands. It's just, it works when you're on the road and you're in a place where maybe uh, you're not going to go to the gym, right? Because you're too lazy or there's not one around. So it's just good in that way. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I think we'll come back to some gym stuff after, but I'd love to just like keep the the flow going of where you you where you've been. So sure. basically, Asia up to the pandemic started, uh, went back to Florida. Uh, needed a little bit more adventure and then you started in Colombia. and then what happened from there? Yeah. I mean, it was kind of a crazy story. So when I came back from, from Thailand, uh, I was only in Vero beach for Vero beach, Florida for a week. And then I was off to Colombia, and I was there for four months. And the reason I left, cause I would have probably stayed there much longer is my dad got sick. Um, and he ended up passing away. So I ended up going back to the U S in May and just staying there. And he passed away on October 20th. And after that, um, while, while he was sick, I I was really stressed out because, you know, it was just, I I knew he was dying and, um, he was 76. So it was kind of, and not in great health. So it was kind of his time, but, uh, I took a trip to Mexico and had a, a really nice experience there. I was there for, I forget how long, just a couple weeks, not even two weeks, I think. Um, but I needed a break. And in that time, I, 
you know, did an ayahuasca session there. I, you know, what else did I do? I, I went, I started doing cave diving. I love scuba diving. I got certified in, in Phuket, Thailand. And, um, so I started doing cave diving, which is really cool, um, to do in that area of, of Playa del Carmen, Tulum, mm -hmm. Cancun, Mexico. And so I started doing that, but had to come back. He ended up passing away. And man, after that, I was like, fuck, you know, I tried staying and I went to Orlando for a little bit, but I just needed to leave the United States again. So I found myself back in, uh, back in Mexico after that. And, um, I left Mexico at the end of 2020 and my business partner, Giselle, she's like, listen, you're, and she helped me with my dad during the, those, those, uh, last months of 2020. She's like, look, come to Brazil. Um, you know, spend the holidays with us. If you don't like it, you don't have to stay, but I think it's, I think it'll be a good change for you. And I, I, so I was like, okay, let's do it. So I went to Brazil, uh, with her got COVID on the flight. <laughs> the flight's terrible to Brazil. It's so hard to get to Brasilia, Brazil in particular. Rio is a bit mm. easier, but uh, man ended up in Brazil and right away when I, so just to give you a little bit of context, I got a brown belt in jujitsu. I did a lot of Brazilian jujitsu in Miami. It's a great place with a lot of high level people, but mm. I got kind of tired of like the Brazilian attitude that I was dealing with there, especially from the jujitsu guys. I was like, some of them are cool, but I, I got into you know, some crowds. I was just like, man, I'm just tired of these guys. And so I didn't really want to come. My, it was my whole dream to come to um, Brazil and train Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So I didn't even really want to go. But as soon as I got to the airport in Sao Paulo, I was like, man, I really like the vibe of people. Because I don't know if you feel this way, Vance, but like after traveling so much, I can get to a place and pick up on the vibe of people and kind of know if I'm going to enjoy that place or not. Mm -hmm. And right away, um, I felt good in Brazil and that led to me staying for eight months here. And that was last year. So Ted, what were a couple of the first things that you picked up on when you landed in Brazil? What are the things that stood out to you about the Brazilian vibe? Yeah. Um, at first I, I couldn't put my finger on it, but Brazilians walk slow. <laughs> And they, they just walk slow. And I don't mean slow, like really slow. I mean, like I walk fast and like, I feel like a weirdo walking at my normal pace. I got to kind of slow down. So Brazilians walk slow. They stroll, you know, they, they're like not in a hurry and just the way they greet you, bom dia, tudo bem, como você está, you know, the way they, just uh -huh. the tonality of their language and, um, even though I, I speak basic Portuguese now, but I didn't speak any, I spoke like zero Portuguese when I first arrived. Uh, it just, you could tell the, the attitude and obviously not everybody's, I've had some experiences here that weren't pleasant, but um, you know, for the most part, it's been one of the, if I was going to live anywhere in South America, Brazil, hands down. And I'm single, <laughs> I mean, like Brazilian culture in terms of the women are amazing, I think, uh, beautiful, um, very fun and communicative, you know, or I don't know, actually, I don't know if that's an English word, but, com you know, that's yep. what they say. Yep. They're communicative. They, they in, communicate in well. In what way? In what way? Just they're like, like, uh, they're easy to talk to. Like, for example, I was in, I was in a concert in Guayana. No, I'm sorry. Perianopolis, which is about, um, it's in the state of Goyas. It's like, uh, about an hour away, two hours away from where I'm at right now in the capital. And I was in this concert. And if you go to a concert in Miami, it's what I'm used to. You need to kind of watch your ass, right? Like someone's going to start a fight or do something stupid or get too messed up. They're did drank too much or on drugs. And just like everybody was well-behaved. And, um, and, and I'm not saying Brazil is perfect because people always tell me when I say nice things about a country, they're like, oh man, but it's not, like, I know, I know about the problems better than most people after living here for nearly a year, but everywhere has problems. And I, I really like the vibe. Like 
I was in this concert and this guy in front of me, he was smoking a ton of weed and he was like, he, he just started a conversation with me. I mean, I couldn't hear him that well. The music was loud and I don't speak Portuguese that well, but you know, he was just like, people were talking to each other and there wasn't like a standoffish vibe. And I really liked that about Brazilian culture. Mm-hmm. And they're very family oriented too, to the point where it can be a problem. There's, you know, some of the women might tell you like, oh, well, you know, the, the, the guys here, they get raised by their moms and they're like, you know, little boys when they're like 40 years old and okay, fine. But I grew up where it's like, well, son, you're 18 time for you to leave. It's like, but I don't know how to do anything on my own. Yeah. You'll figure it out or you won't, but, um, it's what we do here. See you later. You know what I mean? <laughs> And so they're really no, I've enjoyed family. that. I mean, I, I've, I, when I moved to Latin America, I immediately noticed, I was like, why are we partying with like 10 year old kids? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like exactly. oh, that's, that's, that's like the cousins, bro. It's like, all right. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's with the cousins. Exactly. Um, you know, I, I've, I've got a, uh, a niece who's 10, you know, I'm not you know, exactly her uncle, but she can, you know, I'm like uncle Ted or Chio Ted. Right. So, um, exactly. And so like, you know, it just, if I've never had that vibe, even my, I love my cousins dearly. Um, but even us, which are like, Hey, what's going on? Okay. How about you? All right, good. It's like not singing and da- it's not dancing and laughing and just Brazilians. You'll sit down and you'll have conversation. You'll just talk for hours. And what I think they get that Americans maybe don't, it's like you get health. So there's, there's certainly physical health, but there's social health too. Mm -hmm. Emotional. Exactly. And emotional health, but, but specifically like emotional health that we get from spending time with other people. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love that about Latin American culture in general and, and um, especially about the way that Brazilians do it. Yeah, I think this is something that I really want to capture on the My Latin Life podcast because it's very difficult to do in a tweet. It's difficult to do in text format uh, to capture the essence of just how how much um, socialness there is in Latin America and how uh, you'll just end up talking to, to people for like hours and hours and no one needs to go. You know, people aren't looking for the door. People are genuinely enjoy, enjoying each other's time. Yeah. It, it's like spending time with people lessens anxiety instead of increases it. And I feel like sometimes in the States, there's a lot of pressure. Um, you know, American guys, it's like, oh, well, you know, how much money do you make or what do you do or where'd you go to school? And there's more of a competition. And one thing I like, uh, you know, I've talked about the women here, but I really like Brazilian guys too. And in the sense that like, it's like, you know, it's so interesting, like, I get more of a competitive vibe from Americans, not all right, of course, but just I'm thinking back about some of my exchanges in Miami, which is it's standoffish. It's standoffish. It's like, Oh, I'm cooler than you, I think, but not really. I'm insecure. And I really just want (laughs) you to like me, but I'm going to pretend like I'm cooler than you because maybe that'll make that happen. But I'm just going to go home and why am I feel so alone? You know? And then the guys here, they're, you know, they're, they're manly and they are more social, you know, they're more manly than yeah. your average. Uh, I, I've learned a lot about like how to they're, treat they're just women not here. career oriented. So there's no, there's almost nothing to compete on except maybe girls. Yeah. And even with competition with women, um, certainly that's a thing, but like there's just, they have I an abundance more, mindset about that too. I think exactly. Exactly. There's total, like, like I remember I was talking to some American girls and just, you know, when you look in, like you guys say a lot of, I don't want to talk about my dating, um, you know, uh, philosophies yeah, here cool. too cool. much. You don't, you don't, yeah, you don't have to do, you know, but don't one make thing me I'll say tell anything you, that, that you're going to have to edit out. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, but one thing I'll tell you is just like, when you look in a girl's eyes and it's really about like, like, oh, Does, does he think I'm just like the best thing around? And then being in South America, especially in Brazil for me, Medellin's another good place, but you know, my, my heart is in, in Brazil. It's like, no, I'm not that, you know, you're, 
pr- beautiful, but I just, you know, you, once you have that abundance mentality, it just like women can feel that, you know, just like if you're on a sales call and you don't need to be there, uh, the other person can feel that. Um, and that's something you can't fake by like some of the things that we see on Twitter, like, you know, oh, I didn't lean into the photo. It's like, that doesn't matter that much, those techniques. It's really about the vibe you're giving off. And, um, yeah, and, and I've, I've, I've had more of that now where I used to feel very scarce about the dating scene in Miami. Yeah. It's tough to have an abundance mindset when you have a, when you have a scarcity reality, and there's only so much mindset that can overcome like the reality of where you are. And sometimes you do need to move because it is quite location dependent. And as much as we talk about dating markets being internationalized because of Instagram and stuff, the differences locally are enormous. You probably even noticed it just going from Medellin to Brazil, that things that the dynamic was very different. Yeah. Yeah. Dating markets. It's a really important concept um, because you can, and, and by the way, I mean, when I go back to Miami, I, I don't have a pro like, you know, now it's easy, but I don't like the culture there, the dating culture specifically. Um, I, I wouldn't either. And I'll tell you why, because I'll just, you, you won't be able to get a girl to just do something simple, like go for a stroll in the park or get ice cream. Everything has to be like, absolutely like 10 out of 10 adrenaline. Gotta go to because- Prime 112. Because if, because uh, it's just what they just, they have so much competing for their attention that it's like kind of not a healthy market because yeah, it's just all about like, uh, attention. Yeah. Yeah. It, it becomes really weird. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't have problems dating anymore at 45, maybe, may talk to me in 10 years and I'll, you know, but I'm, I'm looking to get married now and settle down. I, I want that. I've mm-hmm. had my fun. But like, uh, absolutely going from, to your point, like even going from Medellin to, uh, to Brazil. Now here's what I'll say about Medellin. Um, I love Medellin. The people are so nice there. I was treated extremely well there. The food is amazing. The thing that I have a challenge with in Medellin and and the women are beautiful. The guys are cool too. Um, the thing that I have an issue with is like, and and this isn't like an issue. I'll just come out and say it like they're in Medellin in particular. It's like, you know, it was the murder capital. I don't know about of the world, but a lot of bad things happen there. And it just has that vibe still. And while I like it as a city, I feel like, you know, the, for example, I dated a girl there and her father, um, was a successful businessman. They were raised well as she was beautiful, Um, but her father was murdered, you know, by these guys who just wanted his money, but his father, I mean, her father, for whatever reason, like resisted arrest, uh, resisted the robbery, which is the number one reason statistically why why tourists get killed, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. in Latin America, um, is, you know, when you don't. Like even I got a brown belt in Brazil, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm just going to be handing over my money. I'm not going to try. Mm-hmm. To, so Medellin, you do need to. You definitely need to be careful. You can't really have your phone out in the street. You, so you, are you finding Brazil by comparison uh, uh, a little bit safer in comparison? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'm in Brasilia, Brazil. It's if you want to go to a place in Brazil and have zero problems, Brasilia is a good place to do that. If you go to Sao Paulo um, or Rio, which I haven't been to either, um, but what people tell me is that, you know, is it violent? Well, I know some people who've been robbed at gunpoint there, but it's mostly kids snatching your phone out of your hand. So people will say, Brazilians will say, well, watch out, you can get assaulted. Uh, But what they really mean usually is someone will snatch your phone, which sucks if you're running a business from your phone, like, like I, you know, I, I use my phone for work too, for, for the social media stuff in particular, but, um, yeah. So I find it, I'll tell you walking the streets of Poblado, I feel safer, uh, in all the areas that I've been in Brazil. So I've been to Brasilia, Florianopolis and Balneario Camboriú. Um, I felt safer there in all those places than I did in Medellin, 
But to be honest, I've never had a problem in Medellin. I've, I've been treated really well. It just kind of feels like, you mm-hmm. know, kind of feels like something could have, there's a little bit more uh, electricity in the air, I would say in mm-hmm. Medellin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, that's awesome that you've been to Balneario Camboriú, uh, as well as Florianopolis. Uh, how much time have you spent in Camboriú? Not much. Um, just, uh, probably a week, but it was, it's nice. It's cause it's a small place, but it, it is nice to visit there. Mm-hmm. What was your, uh, do you have any thoughts on sort of like, uh, Florianopolis versus Camboriú in terms of the difference in the vibe? Yeah. Uh, Camber U is a lot smaller. Um, a lot of luxury buildings there. Um, when I stayed in Florianopolis, I was in Berama, which is like, you know, in the central part of, uh, Florianopolis. Mm -hmm. So it was a good place to branch. I was very safe there and it was good to like branch out and go to different places. I like Floripa better especially that, that better Mar area. Um, Jure de is, is cool too, but it's a little more, I don't know, calm except for the party scene. And that's really not my, my, my thing anymore. Um, but I, I prefer, I don't know. I would have to experiment a little bit more. Um, but I, I would prefer, I think there's more stuff to do in Floripa. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I don't know something about, uh, Camber U is interesting because it's a bit more dense. Uh, it might be a little easier to get around without a car and it seems pretty action packed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I gotta, I gotta, ch- I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I'm with you there. I think they're both cool. And, uh, hopefully this winter I can get down there. We have a, a couple, uh, friends of the podcast uh, in both towns. So I, I would enjoy it. Yeah, have you been? Have you been yet? I haven't been down there. I haven't been to the like the southeast. I guess you'd call it uh, the furthest south I've been would be Sao Paulo and and Foz do Iguazu. Oh, cool! Yeah, um, places I want to go as well, but haven't been. But uh, I really like the south and Floripa. Man, it's a uh, it's super safe there for sure. In, in the Centro area, you can be people are out walking along the beach at the, you know, in the night and you just, there's no, yeah, it's safer than Brasilia. Uh, here in Brasilia, it's quite safe, but my friend just got robbed. Uh, He's a Brazilian dude, uh, does very well, has a CBD business and Mm -hmm. he, um, you know, got his, he got, he got a gun shoved in his face and his Rolex taken. So Don't wear Rolexes down south of the border, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> He's um, Brazilian so, too. He should know better, but you know. Speaking of uh, Brazilian friends, I mean, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing to make friends in Brazil. Do you find most of your friends come from like the BJJ or the gym? Yeah. Um, actually, I met a cross really through other people and – I met some, I was invited to an art exhibit. Uh, There's an art, what do you call it? Art dealer uh, that my business partner was connected with through her family. And so I met her, went to that, went to dinner over at their house, ended up meeting her sister and her sister's husband. They own a CrossFit gym. And, you know, everybody's like art and it's a modern art, which is totally not my thing. You know, like we're traditional stuff or more abstract, like psychedelic art. And uh, so her and I, we got into a conversation about training. We follow some of the same people. And so it's really just, you know, getting out there and talking to people. Um, Who else? I met a guy at the barber shop. Uh, He's from Porto Alegre and uh, yeah, started talking. I'm supposed to see him. I, I'm only going to be here for nine more days. Uh, so I probably won't have to do that. Won't do that much, but yeah, you get out there. I'd say one thing though, it's a little bit tough. You got to know some Portuguese and um, Brazil. That's probably the one thing. It's a great place. And I think it's, 
it's a place everyone should visit if they're interested in South America. Such a amazing place. The food's amazing. People are amazing. But definitely, there's not a lot of English speakers here, for sure. But um, to me, that's to part learn. of the appeal is that, like, me too. If, if you're willing to invest a little bit of time, the the payoff is huge because most people aren't willing to make that investment. Yeah. Pimsleur Brazilian it, Portuguese guys do all 30 lessons. Mm, I haven't even done Pimsleur. Well, it's the one I used. It's it better to, I've done, I've done lessons with a, uh, you know, I've done lessons with someone teaching me too with a teacher, but, um, you know, it's easy to knock out those lessons every day, those 30 minute Pimsleur lessons in the reading included. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I think, I think, um, question for you, how did you end up in Brasilia and why have you decided to keep going back to Brasilia? Is it the family reasons you mentioned or what, what do you like about Brasilia? A couple of things. Um, it's a very safe place to, to be. So, I don't have to worry about, I'm not that worried about like getting kidnapped or something like that, but man, if I got my laptop stolen or my phone stolen, it's a pain in the ass. It's not like you can go to the Apple store. It's not like in the States where you're like, Hey man, they took my Apple phone. Okay. We'll get you another one. It'll be out to you tomorrow. It's, it's a big deal to, to take care of that. So that's part of it. So my, uh, my business partner's from here. So, um, she knows a lot of people here and, um, I lived here for four months last year. I liked it. It's, I get massages. I go, it, they have float tanks here. It's a progressive place. The food's quite good. Oh man. It's a Suga de Berg. I had one of the best steaks I've had in a long time in Brazil. Um, you know, Probably the only thing that beats it is some of the steak places like Prime 112 in Miami. Um, but like, you know, I paid $60 for like a gourmet steak meal here. Um, so so the restaurants are quite good. Uh, the women here, um, they're more they're more oriented towards work and education. So they're not just it's not a party city, yeah, it's better English more educated. Too. Yeah, better English. Um yeah, uh, for sure. And uh, so I like like the if you had to city. if you had to guess like where's the best English in Brazil? It's Sao Paulo, it's Rio, it's Brasilia, and like maybe like Floripa. Yeah, I had uh, yeah yeah I would agree with that based on my ex based on my experience for sure. Yeah, and that's cool that they are people have. Uh, I've heard mixed reports of Brasilia for that same reason because it is a more government city, being the capital of Brazil, and it's a more career oriented city. But it seems that seems to be a, a good balance for you. Yeah, people. What Brazilians will say is they'll move here. It's what they'll say is that it's hard to meet people here because it's very cliquish, and uh, a lot of people who grow up here they're in their own like little groups and it's hard to break into that, especially I guess for the more educated and successful folks. So it's got more of that, um, maybe a little more snobby vibe, but for me, I'm coming from Miami, right? So if people are rude and snobbish here in Brasilia, it's like, Oh my gosh, I'll take this all day long because the culture in Miami is, um, yeah, it's next level, especially like the new areas of Miami, Miami Beach. But but what you say is something to consider depending on where you're coming from, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. I'd love to spend a bit more time trying to capture the essence of Brazil and, and kind of the people. Um, maybe you've heard sure. the phrase, uh, uh, how do you say it? The best of Brazil is the Brazilian, o melhor do Brasil é o brasileiro. Uh, have you heard that one before? Um, I, I haven't actually, no, I've, I've heard they, they say everything is the best, right? O melhor, uh, sorvete do Brazil. You know what I mean? They say everything is the best in Brazil for the, but yeah, I, I could, I agree with that though. Brazilian, Brazilians and Brazilian culture. It's what makes a place. Yeah. T maybe you have a couple anecdotes, Ted about just times where you were surprised, like how nice people were 
or how quickly an interaction progressed and you were invited to someone's house or someone helped you out with a task, you know, cool kind of wholesome anecdotes like that. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was going to Florida for the first time, I was, it was weird. You know, it was like, I felt it was just kind of, I got a weird energy. It, it was after I had recovered from COVID and I was just learning Portuguese. So I didn't feel that comfortable. And, um, I was on the plane ride to Floripa and I sat next to a Brazilian girl and we just talked the entire time. And she had a, she was married. It, there was no, there was no like, Oh yeah, let's hook. You know, it was nothing. It was just like conversation. And so, and she was, she was like, Oh, you got to talk to my cousin. He does, he does scuba diving and, Oh, I forgot. Bombinas and in a, in a city mm -hmm. that's near Floripa, they don't do scuba diving in Floripa. They, they do it in the city that's close. Yep. And, um, is it Bombinas? Yeah, near, near yeah, it's near Camboriú. Yeah. And so she's like, Oh, my cousin. And so she invited, she, she introduced me. And also one other thing, usually when you have that plane conversation, like as soon as the plane rides over, it's like off. And she like waited for me to walk off the plane and like, it was just nice, you know, and I've never been to, even on the way to Colombia a few times, I've, I've been in conversations with people, but, or Mexico, Mexicans are cool too, you know, but Brazilian, like I've never, I've never had someone do that before. And it was even in the States and she would just, we walked together. And again, there wasn't any sort of any other agenda other than like two people who talked and have a connection and we're not, we didn't exchange information. I got her cousin's number and we just went our separate ways, but it was more pleasant than that usual plane conversation that gets real awkward when people are trying to leave the airplane, you know? Definitely. Ted, do you still drink? Um, I do, but I don't. So I don't say no, man, I, I don't drink. Um, but I just haven't, the last time I've, had alcohol was in Lisbon where I tried Ginginha, the cherry liquor, and they serve it in a chocolate shot cup, which is <laughs> incredible. So it's, that's the last time I've, I've drank, but I enjoy wine, but, uh, for some reason I haven't been able to kind of make myself bring myself to drink much lately. Do you find in Brazil, there's like a different type of peer pressure to drink? Man. Um, I, you know what? I'm going to change my story here because I was, I told you that I had gone to this art dealer's house and she has these art exhibitions and it's like part of an installation of her mansion here in Brasilia. And so I was over at her house for dinner and her husband just would not leave me alone about the wine. And it was really good wine too. So that's actually the last time that I drank and he was quite insistent and I don't, I'm okay. I like, I don't get, I left most of the wine just sitting there, but I took a few sips and, and, it, and it was probably the best white wine I've ever had. Um, I'm not a huge, like very knowledgeable about wines in general. And certainly I like red more than white. So I don't know much about white wines, but it was really good. Um, so there is, there is a culture of drinking here, but, um, the that's Botecos. The botecos, yeah, but I don't, I don't know it. That's not something uh, I have a lot of experience with. No, yeah, for some reason I can't really see you at the boteco with a, a forty ounce and a fried empanada, aka a pastel. Yeah, yeah, I've had pastels and I've the empadão guayanos and the you know <laughs> what else uh, brigadeiros, beijinhos. Yeah. Um, pão de queijo, yeah. you know, I've, I've had it all, but, but, um, but yeah, I don't hang out. I, I actually, you know what? I've been to a Boteco in Miami and that's when I was drinking more. Yeah. Caipirinhas I used to <laughs> love Caipirinhas, but I haven't even had one since I've been to Brazil. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Brazil. I mean, Brazil is definitely a very fitness focused culture. I, I think I've heard that Brazil has like the most gyms per capita of any country in the world. Does that ring true for you? 
Man, I love the fitness focus here compared to even Medellin, which, you know, people look after themselves there. They dress well and the, the gyms are popular, but smart fit, which is all over, um, all over South America. It's a Brazilian mm -hmm. brand, mm -hmm. um, a Brazilian business. And so, yeah, I mean, from what I've experienced way more fitness oriented, if you're in Berdemar in in Floripa, people are running, they're on bikes, they're walking in the gyms they are super busy. Um, yeah, it's, it's way more fitness oriented than Mexico or, or Colombia. Yeah. Uh, that, that must be one of the best parts for you. For sure. For sure. I, I, I really connect with the, the culture in that way. Also, I feel like, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not like so, you know, I say oh, I got a brown belt and dumb Muay Thai. I'm just, you know, I did some competitions back in my day, but I'm no like, you know, badass or anything. Um, but I'm not concerned so much about like, oh, this guy wants to fight you or something like that. Like, like, you know, which is something I, I don't, I should put that a little bit better. There is, I do believe you got to kind of walk around. You can't be like, you can't have a target on your back here. Um, in South America in general, uh, you, you got to look like you can handle yourself and, and you'll just avoid less trouble. But, uh, in Colombia, it's like, okay, either a guy's got to have a gun or a knife or, uh, there's no problem. You know, I'm going to be able to handle myself, but in Brazil, man, people are big here. They're tall. Wait, I'm, I'm, um, you know, barely pushing six feet. People are tall here. They're in shape. Um, there's a culture of, of like, you know, there's a lot of Brazilian black belt, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. So like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really cool place, but I also find there's less, at least in my experience. Um, I know fights break out everywhere and certainly in Miami, but, uh, and, and certainly here as well. But like, I just, you know, there's more, there's not that vibe. I I've never been in a situation yeah, where like, yeah. Like, whoa, this guy wants to fuck me up here. He wants to, whereas, and I can remember in Medellin, this dude was walking um, behind me right before I got into my hotel. Now he was a small dude and probably wasted, but, um, and just for no reason, just a, just, you know, a street maniac. It's not like I said anything or did anything to him. He just saw me, saw a green go, just kind of went for it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was no problem, but you know, even so, if he so would have came for up you. to me. Sure. Um, so you did some BJJ when you were in Miami before ever even coming to Brazil. I guess you've done some BJJ training now in Brazil. Was there was there an adaptation process? Yeah, you know what? I have not trained Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in Brazil. Weirdly enough, maybe I'll make it happen before I. I've trained more Muay Thai lately these uh, these days. So I've trained more Muay Thai in Brazil and ironically, not ironically, but coincidentally, um, we, Brazilians are highly respected in Thailand for their for Muay sure. Thai ability. For sure. So, have you, so tried, have trained, you tried capoeira? No, man, I've seen it. I appreciate it, but, uh, I've got a lot of injuries. So, so it's like, I'll be safer hitting pads and like even some light sparring than I will trying to do like the backflips and the craziness <laughs> that capoeira people do. You know, I'd rather take a, a shot to the ribs or something than try to do some of those um, athletic moves. But it's very Man, cool. I feel like I've it's the it. next step. It's uh, resistance bands and then it's backflips. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, <laughs> one arm backflips. Yeah. I'm from a school, uh, uh, MMA school in Miami. They they actually use capoeira in MMA. Um, the the two people who uh, are like the head coaches. One's Daniel Valverde, uh, who's the guy who gave me my brown belt, uh, world jiu jitsu champion and, and South American judo champ. And his partner Caesar is like a, a capoeira master, a capoeira master, and they they use it you know, in MMA. Mm -hmm. so yeah, no, I was just kind of wondering legit. in general, if going from like an American gym, even with uh, good world respected trainers, and then going to a Brazil gym, did you almost feel like, uh, like, uh, like they were just way better in Brazil? 
man, I got to, tr- I got to train with people here, but I was training with uh cyborg Abreu in fight sports in Miami. I mean, mm-hmm. the dude's Brazilian. He's a world champion. One of the best, uh, I mean, during his time, I, I don't know who's popular or winning all the championships now, but I think, uh, Americans, man, I think, you know, I don't know. I don't know what this scene's like anymore, but I'll tell you enough, enough has changed Brazilian jiu-jitsu, especially with grappling. It's like, it's not Brazilian jiu-jitsu anymore in the sense that like it's been merged into what's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now is like Sambo American wrestling, Greco Roman wrestling. Um, you know, it's just like shoot fighting, like all this stuff. Brazilians just took everything and the sport has evolved so fast, but certainly they're the ones that led the way. So I don't know who's uh, where it's better or who's winning what now, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the best people were in the States. Mm -hmm. So you've been in Brazil for a while now. Uh, I think you only told me before we started recording, but you're headed to Portugal next. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, why, why Portugal? Great question. Like I've never been to Europe and had that, full European experience. Um, and I went to Lisbon earlier this year and, um, I was dating this Brazilian girl. She ended up moving there. We ended up splitting ways after dating for the better part of a year, but, uh, she um, moved to Portugal on you. She, well, she moved there. And then we, we have kind of one of the reasons it's like, I'm, I'm moving around. She's moving, you know, like yeah, yeah she yeah. moved to Portugal. So it happens to me all the time. <laughs> exactly. It can be, it can be tough unless you really feel like, Hey, we're going to make this work no matter what. Cause the, just the chemistry is there. And, um, she's got some things that she wants to do in her life. And so anyway, um, I went there earlier and, uh, I just fell in love with the place. I'll tell you though, I thought, I don't know if you know Portuguese from Portugal. I thought I was going to go there. I'm like, man, I'm going to step my Portuguese game up. So I'm going to go to Portugal. And it's like, mm-hmm. they speak completely differently. It's like not even worth. And they yeah, all speak my, English. My, my listening comprehension with uh, Portugal Portuguese is much lower. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't I, exactly super low. And I'm, I struggle here with fast conversations, but there it's just like, man, I, I can tell like one every five or six words. Uh, and it's so different. The slang's different. The accent's different. But, um, what I do like is now's your chance, de- by the way, I, I don't want to speak it. I think it, <laughs> I, I, I apologize if any Portuguese people are listening, but I just, it, it's like, I'm going to just stick with Brazilian Portuguese. They call it Brasileiro <laughs> there. They don't call it Portuguese. Uh, okay. It sorry. Brasileiro. I cut you off. Though. What's that? I cut you off though. Uh, oh yeah. With the experience why I'm heading out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it, for one thing, I really fall, fell in love with Brazil. Um, I didn't know that much about Brazil other than, you know, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu experience and hanging out with that crowd in Miami. And then when I got to Portugal, the same thing, like we get taught about Spanish, the Spanish and the Spanish, you know, all the, the exploration that the Spanish did. But then I went to Portugal and I was like, man, these guys, they don't, they have a really powerful history. Um, some good, some, some of it's amazing. Some of it's, you know, nothing to be proud of. And it's a very complicated situation with Brazilians, uh, with Brazil and Portugal. But, um, that aside, like, um, you know, there's a lot of Brazilians there. And, uh, so I like that about it. Uh, it's Lisbon in particular. It's just, it's not just Brazilians there or there. It's like, it's just one of the hottest cities in the world right now. And I, re- I love the energy of it. Um, and yeah. so it's, would you say like, that the, that Lisbon is one of the hottest cities right now or most popular cities? It's one of the hottest cities in the world for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's getting, <laughs> it's getting harder to get an Airbnb there during the summertime. It, I never heard much about Portugal, never cared about going there, but then people started talking about it maybe 10 years ago and then like heard more and more about it and then finally had the opportunity and, um, you know, fell in love. Uh, and 
yeah, it's a lot of the things that I like about South America with a lot of the things that I don't like. I feel safer walking around the streets of Lisbon, uh, certainly than I do in Miami. Um, it's super safe. The mm-hmm. violence is extremely low in Portugal in general. It's a small population, small country too. Maybe that has something to do with it, but yeah, it's just, I really like the vibe there and it just, it's exploding with startups and, you know, they're, it, it's just a city. It's, it's a good city to buy a place. in. I'm, I'm really looking to see if I can make that happen too. There's a, you know, I, I would like to have that. Yeah. I know you mean, home I've, I've actually, been, I've actually been looking into setting up a base in Portugal myself. Yeah. It's a good, good for taxes. Good for so many things. Right. Mm-hmm. And would you just start in Portugal and kind of do a whole Euro trip or are you really trying to uh, double down on Portugal? Double down on my business right now. Cause if I do that for the rest of the year, I'll, I'll have, I'll be able to do a lot more next year. Um, so that's really the focus, but, uh, but yeah, I would love to see, I want to see Barcelona make my way over to Paris. I mean, like I'll make something. I got a couple months, uh, before I got to go to Mexico for my client. So I'll make something happen. Yeah. What would, uh, what would doubling your business or doubling down on your business look like? Yeah, it would. Well, I'm doing it right now. I'm getting on more podcasts. This is my second podcast today. I'm thank working you, on you. writing more. Yeah, I love it. It's I love having these conversations, even though it's it's you're not you know we're not talking about what I typically talk about. But I'm really passionate about travel, um, even though it's not my business. But um, it it's getting better at social media, um, getting better at writing. I'm in a writing course right now. It's just changing the game for me because one of the things is just being able to, I've, I've got so much experience and knowledge. It's like, but I, I really struggle to convey it in a meaningful way. So I'll say, man, I've been in this business 23 years. Don't you know how much I know? And people are like, no, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it sounds like a long time. So it's just getting better at communicating and sharing what I know, mm-hmm. um, doing more interviews, having people on my show. Uh, yeah. And just, uh, yeah. Getting the systems in place, training my assistant coach. Definitely. Uh, question for you. So you've done over 500 podcasts or audio recordings of some nature. Um, what have you learned from doing hundreds of podcasts? What have been some of your biggest aha moments? Sure. I'll start with, some of the more harder lessons is that you have one impression to make with a new listener. And it's not someone's going to come to your show and hear your information and go, man, that guy sucks. Although I have had that happen, (laughs) but, uh, and they left a a review on, you know, Apple or iTunes rather, but really what I'm more afraid of, because, because I think most people can tell I'm coming from a place of wanting to, to help and be of service, Mm -hmm. um, is people showing up hearing like a, an average episode and go like, okay, I'm never coming back here. It's not like a screw this guy. It's more like, no, that was not very good at all. And I'll never come back because it's just, so, I uh, um, so you really got to put out great information and, um, hold yourself to a high standard. But at the same time, you've got to, you've got to understand that you're only going to get better by being consistent and putting in the work, but certainly working on the delivery. Uh, so that's something I learned. Um, another thing that I learned is that, uh, that who you spend time with is really important and it shows up in a podcast in the way that like you and I are having this conversation. I've had so many people on my show experts who I would have to pay money to talk to because we have no relationship other than, you know, like a professional one, let's say. And -hmm. then they sit down and I get to ask them whatever I want. And I get instantly smarter by having that conversation. Which reminds me, Ted, I need to know how to get the perfect six pack right now. No, I'm joking. Oh yeah. I'm joking. (laughs) Just joking. Yeah. No, I think, uh, yeah, it's a great way to expert, uh, sorry, to network with experts. Yeah, I got my first keynote speech from doing a podcast from a listener. 
a listener reached out to me and we had a conversation. She shared something personal with me. I helped her. And this was before I had any coaching, um, coaching programs or anything. I ended up getting my first keynote speech from her and she's actually a coaching client in my coaching group right now. And she's crushing it. She's, she's, I've helped her more than the whole 30 has ever helped her or any of these other things. And so, um, you know, there's, there's business opportunities and, in, and, in, in creating relationships, um, through podcasting and just so many opportunities can come about this, uh, through this. And, um, mm -hmm. I'd say do something you guys, do you guys else run ads for what on the podcast? Like, do you guys have sponsors? Oh, sponsorships. We're going to probably go back to that, but we don't now. We okay. don't now, but we're going to look into doing that. We've been using the podcast as a way to kind of, you know, help people, but also as a lead generation to, yeah, to build a relationship. If people want. And then how yeah. do you have, do you have like some sort of call to action? Uh, and then what are you trying to direct people to? Like, how do you convert them from a listener to uh, someone that furthers the relationship with Ted Rice and Legendary Life and, uh, you know, uh, gets more involved? Yeah, um, I think probably, well, what we ask is, for example, I ask people to keep the conversation going with me on Twitter is one thing I ask. Um, another thing is if people do feel like they want body transformation coaching, I ask them to hop on a call with me and then we talk and it's not like side, I'm not selling a piece of like Louis Vuitton luggage where it's like, Oh, well, it's nice. It, it holds your stuff. It, you know, holds up to travel well. And then they buy it and they, you know, go use it. And we never have to talk ever again. It's like, once they buy into coaching, it's a relationship and it's mm -hmm. months long and mm -hmm. the relationship between a coach and the person coaching them, coach and coachee, probably the most important thing for results. Um, if I'm honest, it's like the strategies are important, but if there's not a good solid foundation there with just that, that personal connection, uh, probably not going to go too far. So, so that's the call to action is to, to hop on a call with me. If they're, if they're the, if they're a founder or CEO, entrepreneur, a uh, high performer of some sort, busy professional of some sort, and they, they want to take their health to that next level and their body in particular, their body fat, grow muscle, and just get to that next level. Um, yeah. Hop on a call and let's talk. This is the CTA. Yeah. And what does your ideal client look like? Um, yeah. You know, I have ideal clients. So some of my clients are uh, I'm thinking about one now he's, he's got to lose maybe 60, 70 pounds. Um, I love working with the guy. He, he just sold his company. Um, so he's, he's really looking to get his health handled. So he's 60 looking to get his health handled. And he's just like, it's really a big deal for him to conquer this area of his life. And he's willing to put in the work and invest the money and time into making it happen. Um, so, so that's an example of a client I've worked with. Um, there's Trevor who's, who's 47. Trevor has been giving me a lot of referrals because he was already in decent shape at 17% body fat, but we cut him down all the way to 12. Maybe even, he might be even a little bit lower now, but he's ripped. People are telling him he's got a perfect body. And, uh, he says, man, I'm almost a little embarrassed sometimes taking off my shirt. It's like a, I feel like a woman might feel if they've just got a boob job, you know, and, uh, because he's, he's very, he just looks like, you know, he looks like Brad Pitt fight club and, uh, and he, but yet he's drinking alcohol and eating in restaurants. So people can tell he's enjoying his life too. And he just got, he's got the glow, right. Where he's not mm -hmm. like shredded, but like, no, I can't. I can't eat anything past me another piece of broccoli and chicken breast. You know, he just came back from vacation in Maui and was in Italy and eating pasta and he's living life. Um, and, but he was a very different situation. He was already doing quite well, working out hard, but needed some help going to that next level. Mm -hmm. Would you say most of your clients are just 
need an extra push, get to the next level type of guys, or they're like, they're more, uh, more serious cases where they need to go undergo a, a more drastic transformation? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. And I would answer it. There's two types of clients. There's clients who really they're working hard with strategies. Most of their life is taken care of. It's in a good place. Um, but they're just the strategies they're using aren't working. And I've been in this business for a long time. I, I know how to get people results with strategies. Um, and so a lot of people just need the right strategies and they don't, they just don't know because they're an expert at whatever they're an expert in. Like I'm not an expert in, um, you know, a, uh, running a, a sales company or, um, brokering yeah. commercial real estate deals. No, I get I, it. It's like no most idea. people want a mentor in every exactly. aspect of, the, of their life. Yeah. And you get results much faster. I've got a business coach. I got a Brazil, you know, I've had a Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach. And so anyway, there's those types of people. And then the second type of person is more like they need executive coaching. So I'll give them the strategies and then they won't work. And what most people think is like, no, there must be something wrong with my hormones or, or whatever the story might, they might be telling themselves. And the reality is there needs to be some changes because usually it's stress or sleep or stress that's sabotaging their progress. And so if you're not dealing with the root cause of the stress and changing the ways you cope with the negative emotions that come up as a result of the stress, then you're not going to, you can have the best strategies, but you're not going to implement them in a way that gives you results. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Um, so question for you, do you see yourself? I know you said that you, uh, you're looking to go back to Mexico in a couple of months, maybe the start of the new year. Do you, do you, do you see yourself going back to Brazil and continuing to spend a significant amount of time in Brazil? Absolutely. I, I think I'll probably end up married to a Brazilian girl. I don't, I mean, it could <laughs> happen otherwise, but I'll end up married and, you know, I, I really like the family the family oriented nature of the culture here. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't have any family anymore, any immediate family. Um, so, so I really like that about the culture. Um, and certainly one of the things I want to do, I want to go to, uh, Marignan, uh, mm -hmm. Fernando Ginoronia, uh, mm -hmm. all the amazing places, um, Jalapão, all these places that I haven't been able to go. Brazil is just one of the, one of the things I like about it too, as you know, it just has all this amazing, it's a huge country. <laughs> so there's all these it's different places. It, exactly. Exactly. And so um, I'm, I definitely will be spending more time here and exploring more. Mm. So when you go to Portugal, you're going to be focusing on uh, Brazilian uh, friend making. Yeah, I'm already uh, talking to women there, and there's a lot of Ukrainians and Russians and Portuguese and French and Italians. But uh, who I end up connecting with is usually Brazilians. For sure. I'm open it's easy to, whatever, to meet them. But yeah, no, I I agree. When when I'm back in Canada, or the states, I still sort of target Latinas because I just have the playbook. I know exactly what I want to say, like when I get on a date, and. Uh, I just overall just prefer the vibe and everything. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. Um, I wanted to ask like one or two more questions about Brazil. Let's do it. And I'm going to cut the pause. Well, I think, <laughs> Yeah. So I guess, you know, as we're wrapping up, one of my last questions would, you, would just be like, you know, how much are you thinking of like a cohesive international strategy? Because it sounds like you do want to spend a lot of your time outside the United States, um, you know, a significant portion of your year outside the US. Have you considered like truly setting up a base either in Brazil or in another Latin American jurisdiction or something like that to sort of... Um, make a more sort of formal push outside the United States? 
I'm thinking of, I'm, I'm not going to give up my citizenship or anything like that, but I would like to, I, I want to buy a place and is it going to be in Brazil or is it going to be in Lisbon and, and have that be my base of operations? I'm not sure yet, but, um, but one thing, so, so one thing, all my clients or, or at least the majority, I, I've got a Norwegian client, you know, UK clients and that Canadian clients, but most of my clients come from the U S uh, one thing I I'm really excited about doing is, um, and the, and what I'm doing in Mexico, the reason I'm going back there is for an inclined experience, but like to have more breakthrough experiences live with people. Um, so that's what I'm really excited about. And I want mm. to merge travel with that because the people who I usually attract love to travel as well. And so taking people to Brazil and doing something with them there, or like my client who's going to meet me in, in Mexico. Yeah. We're going to do all the health and fitness stuff and he's going to come back with a, a solid strategy to get better results but we're going to do some breakthrough stuff. We're going to do um, something involving scuba diving there. Mm -hmm. And also there's a breath work person. So I'm going to create these breakthrough experiences. Are, are you going back to Playa del Carmen? Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you got, is the breath work guy's name uh, George or uh, Georgie? Georgie? Her name is Sabine and she's Sabine. from Vienna. Okay. Yeah, maybe but they're connected. Good to know there's someone I know, else there. Yeah, there's a couple like breathwork uh, experts that that hold uh, workshops in Playa. Yeah, it's a it's a good place for things like that. Sweet. So you're gonna go back to Playa, also one of my favorite spots. Um, hopefully, things uh, potentially line up for us to meet up in person, potentially in Europe this fall, if I end up setting up this base in Portugal that I'm looking into, uh, or maybe in Playa del Carmen, if I go pop in and, and visit the squad down there. Uh, so it'd be cool, uh, to meet up in person at some point. Yeah, let's do it. Love to connect with people. And I would even say to people listening right now, you know, um, that saying about your network, it's so important to get out off the internet and go meet people in person. It's going to make you healthier. It's going to improve your opportunities. It's going to change the way you see, um, you know, see your life. Yeah. Make sure let's, let's do it, Vance. Let's make it happen. Yeah. A hundred percent agree. I think it's scientific too. Like it'll literally change the flow of hormones and testosterone and all that in the body if you go out and, and hang out with a bunch of people. Yeah, certainly it increases feel good, feel good chemicals. And uh, too many of us, especially like us guys who are like running our businesses or girls who are running their businesses online, it's like um, it, you really feel it then. Uh, I used to have such a social job when I was in Miami and doing personal training, but now I'm just staring at computers all day long or iPhones and to get out, you really feel the difference. But, uh, yeah, it's just the network is, is the key hanging out with other high level people. There's a cool squad in, uh, Playa as well, uh, that I was hanging out with towards the end of the year. I mean, we were going to the Hyatt spa instead of the happy hour, we would go to the Hyatt spa and do cold plunges and sit in the mm. saunas and have these crazy conversations about crypto and other types of things. And you just learn so much who you hang out with. It, it really affects, um, you know, the level of conversations that you're having it really affects your mindset, how you see things and, and certainly your opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for everyone rags on Playa del Carmen, but there's definitely a lot of really interesting people there. And you can have some really high IQ discussions with the people that you meet there. Yeah, you know, on La Quinta, they'll try to sell you cocaine every block, you just politely decline and you know, you keep going. Yeah. And uh... there's definitely a whole side to Playa that's very spiritual. And there are people that don't go out at all. And they're just kind of all about the yoga and the beach and maybe entrepreneurship. So there's different sides to the, to the city for sure. Yeah. 100%. And Ted, I really got to give it to you. I mean, I, I got to hand it to you that, um, you know, you, you went from, you know, just 
being a on-site personal trainer in Miami, in the States, uh, which is very different from being an online focused personal trainer with a brand and all the, you know, online marketing skills that you must have had to learn along the way and the transition uh, from word to mouth to more building a, a public facing brand. And not everyone can make that transition. It's not easy. And it seems like you've pulled it off. Yeah, man. Um, things are going well and it it's not easy, like you said, but when you know something's right for you, you got to go for it. And I always knew there was something about this whole online world that was right for me. So I went for it and the time's going to pass anyway. So might as well go for your dreams. Yeah. I mean, it definitely sounds like you're living an interesting life. Uh, and that's why we wanted to have you on the My Latin Life podcast. And I can tell the future is, is going to be full of just as much adventure. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, thanks Vance. I really appreciate you having me on today. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely, man. I feel like you're just getting started, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been with business, you know, we've been doing well for a while, but certainly like it's going to, it's going to be next year is going to be look very different. And if I could give any advice out there, I was struggling business wise and I hired a coach. Uh, to help me. And when I hired a coach, I went from making a couple grand a month to, you know, we've had 40 grand months, you know, and, uh, and it's not just about the money because you can hustle your ass off and make money. But what a lot of people can't do is also make money in a way that doesn't like burn them out and make them hate their life. Mm -hmm. And, um, the instruction, hiring someone to help you, getting someone to help you can help so much. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what I meant was like, I feel like 2023 is going to be your 10 X year. Uh, thanks Vance. I think so too, man. You know, I, I'm a more short, you know, I'm not a business sort of guy. I'm having to learn it. Like, like you alluded to earlier, it's, it's been hard to make that transition from coach to CEO, right. Or you know, <laughs> whatever I'm supposed to call myself, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, it's going to be an interesting 2023 and I'm really looking forward to it. Well, cheers to more, uh, 40 K months and Ted, thank you for coming on the, my Latin life podcast. It was a pleasure to hear about your experiences, uh, uh, digging into entrepreneurship, traveling the world, spending basically a whole year in Brazil and the traveling sounds like it's going to keep going and, you're going to see lots of uh, tropical beaches in the near future and uh, super excited for you. Yeah. And we'll, we'll clean classes one of these days, either in, in, in Lisbon or uh, maybe in Playa. Yeah. We'll have a protein shake. Uh, I'll be working out with you. You can't tell, but I, I, I got, I, I'm, I'm in shape too. <laughs> I, I, I don't doubt that at all. <laughs> cool, man. Well, thanks again. I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast.